Thanks for checking out a sermon from First United Methodist Church located in Sheridan, Wyoming. To learn more about who we are, please check out our webpage at fumcsheridanwy.org. Our scripture reading is from Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. The parable of the wedding banquet. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, He noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Bible for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, I ask that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing and glorifying to you. Amen. Over the course of the last couple of weeks, we have been uh, listening, experiencing these parables that Jesus has been teaching, talking to the chief priests, uh, the Pharisees, the elders of the temple. This parable this morning is the final parable. So this is the last of the three that we have uh, set up over the course, again, of the last couple of weeks. Now, as we listen to that parable, I think it's important to recognize how confusing, maybe even disturbing, and just how deep this parable is. Over the course of these three parables, Jesus has been trying to be very pointed over and over again to try and get the people that are listening to this, the chief priests, the elders, the Pharisees, to understand what he is sharing. I think that it is really important, though, as we look at this last parable, that we understand a little bit more about Uh, what we know as Matthew's gospel. So I just want to give you a little bit of background because I think it will help us as we look at this parable today. Now, surprise, surprise, there is a lot of debate among scholars around authorship and the date in which Matthew was written. Traditionally speaking, the gospel is named Matthew because in uh, traditional history, we believe that Matthew is the one that wrote the gospel. Along with that, we also traditionally have believed, believed that Matthew was written somewhere in the 70s. 
Obviously not 1970s. In the 70s. So sometime after 70 AD. Now why is that important? I'm glad you asked. That is important because in 70 AD is when the Romans came in and burned the temple to the ground. All right? So 70 AD is when the temple was destroyed. Now, the purpose behind Matthew's gospel uh, is to address the needs of the Jewish Christian readers. His readers would have been in conflict with the Pharisaic religious establishment because the early Christians were uh, blamed for the destruction of the temple. So Matthew then is writing his gospel from a post-resurrection and a post-destruction of the temple perspective. And so we can keep that in mind as we listen to this parable this morning. All right. Uh, So let's go ahead and, and enter very lightly into this parable at first, and then we'll go full speed in. The story that we experience this morning is about a king that is giving a wedding banquet for his son. A wedding banquet is a big deal. We're talking about one of the most significant and important celebrations in the life of an individual. This celebration would have gone on for days. It would have been the party of all parties Not just one night, which is what we're typical of experiencing now. So then when we we talk about this parable, uh, Matthew again likes to allegorize these parables, these three. And we have done that over the course of the last couple of weeks. So we're going to do that again this week. Matthew... Uh, I I believe Matthew wants us to look at these characters in this parable and draw the following connections. The king would be God. The son of the king would be Jesus. The initial guests would be Israel. The wedding celebration itself is meant for us to understand it as the salvation banquet. The first group of servants would be the Hebrew prophets. The second group of servants would be Christian disciples. Now, when we start to look at this parable then, and we start to try and, uh, and wrestle with what is being talked about, In the first half of this parable, when the king is inviting folks that he's already invited to the banquet, only instead uh, instead of receiving those people, they decide not to come. That should sound familiar from last week. The first half of the parable today draws a direct connection to the parable last week. Only instead of people coming to a banquet, they're supposed to be giving the harvest that they grew. Instead of collecting the harvest, the people are invited to a great banquet though. Uh, So remember... As we look at this parable, it's important for us to continue to think about who Jesus is talking to. He's not talking to a crowd of people. He is talking to leadership. He's talking to the chief priests, uh, politicians, chief priests. He's talking to the elders, and he's talking to the Pharisees. So we can keep that in mind. What we experience in this parable as a whole that this parable talks about is God's plan of salvation of life. Now, that was supposed to be experienced by the original covenant that God made with Abraham, that God will be their God and that they will be blessed to bless others. 
the challenge that unfolded. And if we look at the Old Testament as a whole, we, we notice that throughout the ages, not all the leaders listened to the prophets that God was sending. In fact, some of the prophets that were sent were killed because of the message that they brought, the message that the leadership didn't want to hear. So when we start to to look at the first part of this parable, then we can understand that what, what the parable is referring to is history, this first part. The leadership of Israel was invited to the banquet of salvation, but they didn't come. Over the years, the Hebrew prophets were sent. They didn't listen. Now remember, Matthew is writing from a post-resurrection, a post-destruction of the temple uh, view. So who then are these second servants that get sent? I told you just a little bit ago. Christian disciples. So then the Christian disciples were sent and they still didn't listen. Now, in the parable, when a king invites you to a banquet, if you would refuse the invitation, that was equivalent to a rebellion. Now remember that Matthew is writing to struggling Jewish Christians. So the idea of the leadership of the temple being viewed as rebellious would, I I think, make the readers feel a lot more comfortable where they're at. But here in a couple verses, he's going to make the readers uncomfortable where they're at. So the idea then that Christian people are being killed along with the faithful prophets of Israel is meant to encourage them in their walk, uh, which I think for us is strange. Uh, But for the early church, that would have been encouraging, which is why he makes the connection here of the first servants, Old Testament prophets, the the, the next set of servants, Christian disciples. Now we hear that the king wants to burn the cities down uh, to where these ungrateful leaders live, right? And, and that makes us feel uncomfortable. It makes me feel uncomfortable. There's a lot of uh, uh, harsh language in this parable, right? Uh, what do you think Matthew would be referring to as being burnt down? The temple, yeah. The temple, remember, Matthew was writing from a post-destruction of the temple uh, uh, vision. So when we hear that the burning down of the temple, that happened in 70 AD, uh, this then in the parable, after, after the, uh, the readers can connect with this, the parable shifts. The parable shifts and a new group of people are invited to come to this salvation banquet. They are again invited by another set of servants that are uh, again Christian disciples. What's interesting here is the language that Matthew uses corresponds with the words used in the Great Commission. The Great Commission is found in Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. Uh, And this is what it says. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. When you look at the same way that these next servants are sent out, they're sent out with the same language. It starts in the same way. That is not... A coincidence that's intentional for us to make this connection. Now, there are no longer restrictions here to those who have accepted, uh, like those who have accepted the previous invitation. 
the invitation to the salvation table, which we could draw a connection to the communion table, uh, is recognizing that now that, that invitation is extended to everyone. Everyone is welcome to gather around the, uh, at the salvation banquet. But there's an additional confusing moment that is added at the end of Matthew's parable because there is an interaction with one of the guests and the king. What is up with the king making such a big deal about the clothing this person is wearing? It's not like the, the servants, when they went out and gathered people to come to this banquet, that they, oh, let me run home quick and change. I didn't do my hair this morning, and I want to look good for the wedding banquet. For some, that's easier than others. I don't think that in the parable that the people went home before they they gathered. They didn't change before they went to the banquet. Uh, Remember, this is a parable, so it's not exactly supposed to make perfect sense because we have to try and understand the message behind it, right? So what is Matthew alluding to then? And this is the part where the readers might have felt really, really encouraged or really good at the beginning. But this is the part of the parable where Matthew is trying to directly connect with those who are reading this. Because this is the challenge that is set before us. In early Christianity, the New identity, when one converted to Christianity, was usually pictured as putting on a new set of clothes. So the language of changing clothes was a way of expressing giving up the old way of life and putting on a new identity. One of the clearest examples of this comes from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 14 in Paul's letter to the church at Rome. I am going to read this passage for you, but I'm going to read it from the message. Okay, so a little bit of a different uh, wording than maybe what we're used to. So again, this is from Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. But make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-to-day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off oblivious to God. The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work he began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. Must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence, in sleeping around and dispensation, in bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Dress yourself in Christ and be up and about. Do you hear the wording that Paul uses there? Uh, the wording that Matthew uses in, uh, in this parable around, uh, around being dressed, being clothed. So when we understand that being clothed isn't about the actual physical clothing that we have on, being clothed in this parable is about this individual being clothed in Christ. Now, the wording that Matthew uses is so that we can understand that what he is alluding to is the final judgment, not of an actual wedding party. He uses the apocalyptic expression, weeping and gnashing of teeth, which became a favorite of Matthew to give a picture of the last judgment. 
we don't want to miss how Matthew is challenging us in this moment. He's trying to get us to understand that the manifestation of the Christian faith is shown in deeds of love and justice. Just like Paul explaining it to the church in Rome, he says, wake up, dress yourselves in Christ, be up and about. Matthew, at the end of this parable, is instructing his readers, instructing them, reminding them that they have been invited to the salvation banquet, to the celebration. So live like it. Live like you are at the banquet, celebrating. Live like it. Put on the proper attire for each and every day. Put on Christ. So that you may live a life that reflects the same love, compassion, and mercy that Jesus showed those around him. You have been invited to the salvation banquet. Come to the table and live like it. May we also invite others to join us at this table of God's mercy because they have been invited to. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you We thank you for our invitation to sit at your table. We thank you for your love for us. Help us, God. Help us to express that love to those around us. Help us to clothe ourselves in you each and every day. Help us to live as those called by your grace. And when we fail, pick us up. Help dust us off and send us again. Because God, we are yours and you are ours. We give our lives to you and we ask that you continue to lead and guide us. We love you, God. And we thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's sermon. We would love for you to join us again for worship in person or online, and we look forward to being with you next time.